It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest 231 at block height 641,780 on Saturday, August 1st. Woohoo! Happy Independence Woo. Day! Yay! Number three. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. It's kind of just another holiday at this point, and, uh, People are still intent on trying to gaslight the ever living, ever living shit out of that year. Uh. <laughs> mm-hmm. I still have to tweet. I was going to tweet a picture of my Bitcoin sticker collection, which apparently is shit, according to Candle. <laughs> well, that's not very nice. Well, he says that his is much bigger, so... <laughs> well... I'll say that you're both doxxed anywhere that you use your laptops in public if you got them covered in stickers. Boom. Well, yeah, that's the, the, I mean, that's the reason my sticker collection is so big is because I never put them on anything because I don't want, I don't want to dox the fact that I use Bitcoin. Exactly. I don't even know how many stickers I have at this point. I just throw them in an envelope. But yeah, I guess, uh, uh, you want to just dive into the update on the Twitter hack rather than try to come up with the, the meme banter over the, the user-activated soft fork? Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds like, as of yesterday, a bunch of people who are alleged to have been involved in the Twitter hack have been... Have they all been arrested, or was it just the indictment was released? Um, as far as arrest... I'm not sure, but um, I've just seen the indictments and then the affidavits from the Secret Service agent and the uh, IRS agent from Criminal Investigations. I think, uh, at least what I saw, there was this 17-year-old in Florida who is arrested, who is uh, mistakenly, as you will explain, being uh, painted as the mastermind. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody on Twitter right now memeing about how um, Twitter was hacked by a 17-year-old kid as a mastermind um, needs to learn to read because pretty much um, they haven't caught that guy. They have not caught Kirk, uh, the guy who actually, you know, had the exploit and provided access. Um they busted Mason Shepard, a.k.a. Shawan, um, Nima Fizelli, um, a.k.a. Rolex, and then the Florida miner who is actually um, found in Northern California. Um, in the affidavit from the um, criminal investigations, um, IRS agents um, said that he admitted to being one of the users on the Discord server helping Kirk in terms of facilitating um, the account um, theft and resale. Um, so yeah, um, everybody um, put the meme back in the box and learn to read because we haven't actually caught or even identified the guy who actually had the access and performed the exploit. Um, just pretty much all of the people around him who were reselling accounts. But um, yeah, I mean, also good before we get into that um obviously the the focus even if it's not the right guy the focus still is on the fact that there is a 17 year old involved and apparently the prosecution is has stated that they're going to go for the maximum statutory penalty which could be 40 plus years in prison which that is 
you know, given other things in the news lately, you know, yeah. people, um, 45 years in prison is two to four times the amount that a certain prolific child predator was given. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's kind of a imbalance in how crimes are being addressed in the in the united states to say the least yeah i mean june sith actually kind of put forward a theory on that on twitter that i'm kind of inclined to believe um i think this is one of those situations of scare the young kid with shit tons of time behind uh bars and then try to get him to work at the fbi i mean that that's pretty much the entire um mo as far as like these types of like cracker communities is trying to actually flip somebody and then get a mole on the inside yeah i mean you mean a mole in the inside of the cracker community or you mean a mole that could potentially i mean it's it would be a useful skill for uh, a law enforcement person to be able to socially engineer uh social media platform employees into giving them powerful credentials i mean both really i mean you know you look at zebu from lolsec they pretty much flipped him around and then um arguably entrapped a number of people um with him instigating a lot of actions and then you know kevin mitnick uh -huh. i mean they they put him in jail um pulled him out and then he was doing advisory work and shit for the governments and companies that he used to hack yeah, Zabo is particularly interesting because, or Sabu, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Zabu, um, because he is actually, he's being used as one of the star witnesses by um, the U.S. government in the case against Assange, This the latest superseding indictment. Uh, it, it names him, and coincidentally, um, also a child predator who was actually convicted of this in Iceland um, is also the other FBI informant who is listed as a star witness in the superseding indictment against Assange. So this is a this is a fun time. Uh, lots of <laughs> very, lots of interesting involvement from child predators and the government relying on them or not prosecuting them in comparison to other people. Mm hmm. But, you know, to uh, kind of get into some of the forensic meat as far as how they got busted. I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, you know, a, a very large part of it is um, definitely the quick mix and then immediately recondense through Wasabi and the litany of centralized exchange addresses that were involved in a uh, this whole scheme so that was able to pretty much allow um i believe they tied um mason or shawan's um identity to a binance account and a coinbase account but they also um pretty much went back i think it was in february this year um og users um the the place where they were actually coordinating the sale of handles um had had their um database breached um in february this year and the irs uh criminal investigations agent actually went through the database dump and tied chow wan's um username um to an ip as well as a an email address and actually found another account that he'd had and then from there was able to correlate the ip with the information that they subpoenaed from coinbase and kind of roll everything up but um you know it's, it's kind of a a double fucked situation here um they screwed themselves with just the complete stupidity with which they engaged in trying to mix coins or obscure them on chain and then just something as simple as a, a forums database breach <laughs> uh, got put together and then whoop they followed the trail of the people so it's it's kind of interesting the way that I don't know both sides of the the forensic of that really tied together. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that just, uh, I mean, that, that really just shows you how, I mean, anyone in this space who knows anything knows that you can't, un unless you've somehow, you know, gotten a Coinbase account but doesn't use your real identity, like, maybe they had... I would, I'd be curious to know if they actually had their real identities attached or if they attempted to use like a fake ID or something. Um, it, it, it was, sound um, like it. it was the, the real ID, uh, for Chawan at least, which was what was in the affidavit. Yeah. Like how it just shows how naive they are because I don't know how they thought they could have gotten away with that. It would have gotten noticed instantly. Mm-hmm. But, you know, really, like, the, the main thing I kind of want to just drill home here, though, is, like, Kirk, the guy who actually acquired the Twitter admin access and facilitated all of this, um, still has not been caught. And at least it's my suspicion, based on the fact that he's not even mentioned, um, except for the interactions with people who've been indicted in the indictment or the affidavit, I don't think they've even identified him. So, yeah, the whole meme of it was a teenage kid, see everybody talking about nation state actors, um, that can't be discounted at all right now because we still have not learned anything about the guy who actually acquired this access and used it. Yeah, that's what I find a bit strange. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that people are confused about that because basically all of the mainstream media articles covering this, they say Florida teenager is charged as mastermind or some variation of that. But then when you actually read the article, like in the New York Times, it says the documents, uh, no, a little bit further. Um, as the day wore on, the attack led by Kirk took over dozens of accounts and, you know, etc. Like... They say the attack was led by Kirk, but then their title says that a teenager was a mastermind. Like, what? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what? It's just weird. Um, I also thought it was interesting. Um, they mentioned that federal authorities were already tracking Clark's online activity before the Twitter hack, according to legal documents. In April, the Secret Service seized over $700,000 worth of Bitcoin from him, but it is unclear why. So that was interesting. So they were already aware of him. Again, it's like more naivete. Like if you're already, if you're, if you know that you're already uh, under the eyeballs of the Secret Service or any, any law enforcement agency, the chances of you getting caught when you perform another attack are pretty high. So this attack felt like it was just doomed to fail from the beginning because you had a, a bunch of people who clearly didn't know what, what they were doing in terms of accepting and moving Bitcoin in an actually private way. Um, and then you had them using it with accounts that were tied to their real identity. And you had at least one of the people already being followed uh, and targeted <laughs> by the Secret Service. So yeah, this was a pretty immature scheme, but again, the 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 light is kind of being shifted off of Kirk, and so he's still out there as far as we know. Unless they're maybe going to wait a bit longer and maybe they're still gathering evidence and they don't want to reveal that they've figured out who he is yet. Mm -hmm. Another weird thing, though, is how did the media get this kid's name and why did they start plastering it all over the place when it's literally nowhere in either affidavit or the indictment um i would have to check but um you know as i've learned in a recent case people can be pretty stupid about you know they have some things in the document and maybe they even redact some things and then they leave some things in the metadata of the document so it's not immediately mm -hmm. visible. It's possible that his name was actually included in the metadata of the document somewhere, and that's how they found it. It's also possible that they just, you know, they might have channels with law enforcement, um, and they just asked them, who is it? Or they had some other channel to get the name. But yeah, I also feel like, you know, it's the the whole thing about, 
because they've already said they're going to charge the the minor as an adult and like i get that in florida and some other states you can do that but i just in general i find the concept of charging a minor as an adult to be kind of weird because it's like they're a minor they're not an adult so why are you charging them as an adult it just doesn't make sense to me like either they're a legal adult and they have legal adult responsibilities and privileges or they don't like pick and choose <laughs> like it it doesn't feel fair it, in any case you know this one or a different one to be charging a non-adult as an adult um like, I get that. I get why you'd want to do that, because it means that you can threaten them with more prison time. But again, it just doesn't make sense to me. I get what you mean, but I think it comes more down to the judges or the and the, the judge and the prosecutor's kind of read of how mentally mature they are. You know what I mean? Sure. But again, like they do that because they want to prosecute him more heavily. Whereas if it was a case where he was the victim and he was a minor, he would be treated as a minor and an adult who committed a crime against him would be charged as an adult committing a crime against a minor. So it feels very, it, it's a double standard to me. It's political. I mean, it's just look at what happens when you start hacking around with things in the 21st century. Well, and, uh, you know, plot twist, um, maybe the theories about Kirk being a government agent or state sponsored are not um, completely outlandish if you consider that maybe he is the insider himself and he his his role in this was to actually catch <laughs> catch these uh young crackers and get them prosecuted um like we could the 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 part of him being possibly state sponsored may not have anything to do with actually attacking twitter it might just be an undercover operation against these criminals yeah i mean if you don't like if, if people don't think that the government um, sets up entrapment operations to push a, a narrative in the media or the public um, must be really weird being that naive. And that's why they're mentioning him, but trying to divert attention from him at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you got anything else to add on this one? Not really. No spoofs, no admins. <laughs> All right. So, well, no decentralized Twitter that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm hmm. Fucking spammers. But yeah, this one is just a real quick uh, update for Fully Noted. Um, they just dropped uh, version 0.1.62 which now includes a uh, seamless way to pull the generic uh, watch-only wallet file a cold card can generate and make a single SIG address uh, for your fully noted wallet. So, um, yeah. As far as I am concerned right now, um, anybody I know who uses Apple stuff, um, I'm pointing them to this wallet. I mean, like, at this point... I'm really just fucking amazed at this point. Like, I thought that you might just never really get <clears throat> fully fleshed out, like, proper software for using Bitcoin on iOS. Like, it's just been such a stagnant platform in terms of there's a few, like, 2014 era wallets on there, and then that's it. And, like, they have nailed it. Like, this is one of the most stupid flexible uh just hot wallets out there um <laughs> just ridiculously easy to compose with multi-sig and now at least for the cold card um something that you can securely use to deal with your cold storage like i mean it's i i really thought that nothing like this would ever exist in the apple ecosystem well, uh, given the state of things, who knows how long that may be the case, you know? 
Ben. I don't really see the App Store Bitcoin ban that everybody is uh, worried about or keeps memeing about lately again. Like it's and th- that that seems as silly to me as the idea that the government would ban Bitcoin. Like that horse is so far out of the stable already. Graphene OS. No, no walled gardens. I know. I hate them too. But you know what? Normies feel safe in them. Expensive. Planned obsolescence. I think it would be really funny. I just a thought popped into my mind, but it would be hilarious to record, like, use the same voice as, like, Siri and Alexa, this, like, very robotic and yet human-sounding tone, and do, like, anti-surveillance ads with that. Yeah. I think that would land memely. I don't even know what the hell that word I just made up means. Memely? <laughs> Alrighty. I'm just humbly memely. <laughs> right, I'm gonna just jump into something that I'm betting you won't care too much about, but um, it crypt- the word crypto in it. Yes, yes, it does. Crypto Garage um, has dropped a beta version that right now only works on testnet and a, a reg test network. Um, version of their peer-to-peer derivatives uh, wallet that uses discrete log contracts. So this is really fun in the sense that um, it's pretty much, you know, for anybody who doesn't remember, just a a lightning channel um, type set of pre-signed transactions, except potentially thousands of different pre-signed transactions for different outcomes for a financial contract like a bitcoin futures and the idea is that an oracle um, at the expiration point of the contract will provide a signature for say the price of bitcoin and settle it the appropriate way and if not um, you know just like lightning you'll hit a timeout and people can just pull the money they put um, into the contract back out of it but they have implemented a very bare bones wallet um, that allows somebody to describe, um, and in this case, they're they're just working with BTC um, USD contracts, um, the terms of the contract, and then export that in a uh, CSV file that you can give to your counterparty. And as soon as both sides accept it, it will automatically negotiate the DLC transaction construction. Um, and then pretty much, um, when it comes to expiry time, if both sides of the contract are online at the same time, um, it will just do a automatic cooperative close, um, for whatever the, uh, appropriate end result for the contract is. And if one side is not, then the wallet will automatically trigger the non-cooperative close case. And now one thing they don't really get into in their uh, announcement is exactly how that's coordinated. Um, I'm just kind of assuming right now that there's a central coordination server or something of the like. Um, And this could still be incredibly useful with that. But if I'm right in that assumption, um, personally, I would like to see the next uh, kind of phase of this be building out some kind of peer-to-peer communications layer so that you don't kind of depend on a central server point or anything like that to coordinate this. But um, yeah, this is pretty uh, dope. And uh, aside from anything that SuredBits might be working on, I'm pretty sure this is the first implementation of a uh, wallet or software to actually engage in DLCs. So. We guys, we have another smart contract in the family now. Speaking of which, um, oh god, I wish I remember. I'm gonna have to cite them later, but I saw a joke on Twitter. Um, Shinobi, why did Ethereum go to college? I don't know. Because it wanted to become a smart contract. <laughs> I'm gonna have to find that tweet. Oh my god, that's so bad. It's hilarious. <laughs> 
by the way, Ethereum's birthday was two days ago, and I unintentionally shitted all over them. <laughs> you know, Good. by talking about uh, talking about consensus ties to the Saudi government and how they stole land from native tribes and all of that. Bunch of grade A grease balls. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which. Yeah, I think uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, this is uh, actually a pretty nice uh, show that she's done as far as getting into the, the nitty gritty without going down the rabbit holes too deep. Yeah, so for anyone who didn't see it, um, Whitney Webb was on Tales from the Crypt episode 183, I think two days, two or three days ago, with Marty. Um, to talk about the research that she's been working on regarding Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell and their families and their partnerships in the public and private sector and the whole, uh, as they use the word, cabal network. Um, about, you know, they talk about a lot of things, but about two thirds of the way through the episode, they um, go into a little bit about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, Whitney is not she's not super into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency stuff, but she is somewhat interested in Bitcoin. Um, I've also, the, the way that I came across her research is also because she's, um, uh, she's looked into the stuff with Assange and all of that. And she's a supporter. And, um, on the other hand, her opinion on Ethereum is not very high, and one of the reasons for that is that one of the topics they discussed in the show was the various, digital identity projects that are being thrust out in front of our eyeballs recently and how they, uh, some of them are actually being tested with real human beings in a not so great way. And she cites a Newsweek article from February 2019 titled, Can Blockchain Finally Give Us the Digital Privacy We Deserve? Um, regarding I respond, I as in iPhone respond, um, uh, which is, uh, according to the article, an NGO that helps refugees and others establish their identities using biometric data. Uh, and this this NGO chose the Myla, May, Myla? I forgot how to pronounce it, but uh, it's a refugee camp. Um, and they chose it as, quote, the site of an ambitious pilot program that has captured the attention and funding of some of the leading advocates of the much-hyped but still experimental blockchain technology. Uh, and more recently, on July 29th, which, which I think was the same day as the episode came out, uh, around the same time, she published an investigation titled Charity Accused of Sex Abuse Coordinating ID2020's Pilot Program for Refugee Newborns, which uh, she basically goes into how the iRespond project is telling these refugees at the camp that, um, you know, if you want aid from us, if you want food... Uh, you first need to give us your biometrics, and it doesn't sound like, uh, from what they're saying, it doesn't, or what she found, it doesn't sound like they're actually being told that this data is being taken as part of a pilot program for an identity project, and it's actually really, it, it's also not even useful to them because the article admits that, um, or what she found is that the the CEO um, of iRespond actually admitted that the um i the ids that they're being given in some way or that are they're being tied to them they're not even actually useful as an actual id document they're not recognized as like a birth certificate or anything like that but they're still doing birth certificate type ids for newborn refugee children that are being born in this camp and it's like so you're using these people for your pilot program you're using vulnerable people who are in need of aid and you're waving that in front of their face and saying, okay, you can have this, but give us your biometrics. And then the ID that you're generating isn't even useful to them in terms of like hard, cold documents that they actually need to get around in the world, especially as people who aren't probably, uh, <laughs> who probably don't have a lot of documentation to begin with. Like that seems extremely shady on so many levels. Um, and so the part of the, she didn't talk about the investigation, um, 
uh, too much, but um, as part of the interview, she actually brought up Ethereum and she says that uh, she described the Ethereum founders as real shitheads. <laughs> and she pointed to how the founder of iRespond, who left uh, Deutsche Bank in 2016, I believe that was mentioned in the Newsweek article, um, apparently he sought investment from Joseph Lubin, who is the multi-millionaire slash former crypto billionaire who basically funds most of Ethereum through consensus. So yeah, just interesting tidbit related to Bitcoin from that interview. Yeah, I think that the whole interview is just like, you know, all her work really, I think is like some of the most comprehensive shit in terms of real politics in the latter half of the 20th century. And I mean, like, you know, because you can really take all, all of those threads all the way back to things like the Fed or the Federal Reserve being founded or Smedley Butler and the business plot and the way the intelligence agencies were kind of ripped out of the military after World War II and spun off into their own like independent organizations with a lot of really greasy ties to Wall Street. But it's like those those threads just really fan out after that kind of point in time and just get really absurdly complicated and difficult to follow. And I think like she is probably one of the best people out there I've ever seen in terms of really thoroughly picking them up from around that point and continuing to follow them to the end. Yeah, and it was kind of funny because um, apparently, I think it was when she mentioned Ethereum, um, that I guess before they went on air, she had said that she didn't think, because obviously this is a Bitcoin podcast, and she, I guess, said something about how she didn't think that the listeners would um, would like what she had to say. And Marty had to be like, no, no, actually, they, they will like what you have to say, <laughs> especially about Ethereum, if you're shitting on Ethereum. So, yeah, um, I don't. I would be curious to know whether she's looked into them specifically in more detail than that. But yeah, she's. Uh, and I should also mention one of the stories for the newsletter. I cite her investigation about Jeffrey, or one of her investigations that she's published in the last year or so about Jeffrey Epstein and how how many people and how many agencies and agents and officers knew about his behavior and they didn't do anything like that's also mentioned in in that's going to be cited and has been cited already in the court documents about Ghislaine Maxwell already like there's just so many people who know about it including the government and they literally had him in their hands and they did nothing and it's like the, the reason I mentioned that newsletter is because um, uh, because Chainalysis, the blockchain surveillance company, recently brought a former Department of Treasury woman onto their board of advisors. And she was one of the Department of Justice officials that was cited last year, last summer, as being involved in the Florida deal that basically they had Jeffrey Epstein in their hands. They had evidence against him. He could have been charged federally, and instead they gave him a they gave him a plea deal. They gave him a what, what is it called? Um, uh, I can't remember MPA. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. But basically, he got way more lenient charges, and I think he was only charged at the state level, which meant he it was like so much more lenient. And also, he went to jail for he was supposed to go to jail for eighteen months. He only stayed for I think thirteen, and he was allowed to leave the jail um i think five five days per week mm -hmm. for like 12 hours a day eight to 12 hours a day like that's insane that's that's a sleepover that's not jail um six days per week yeah okay but but like a, a large portion of the week he was allowed to leave for a large portion of the day that's not jail like so so the reason i included it in my newsletter is like you know, we talk about, you know, KYC and anti-money laundering and enforcement and catching catching the bad guys. Like all, of, all of this infrastructure is meant to catch the bad guys. But then it's like, when you get to the point of actually having the bad guys, 
and you have a system that just lets them go how like how 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 is like we're we're putting all of this effort and all of this surveillance infrastructure up and we just let these people go anyway like the most egregious offenders we're just letting them go so what is the point of all of this if if the system at the end of the day is just going to let these people go mhm mm and if the people who are responsible for letting them go just get hired at venture capital firms and blockchain surveillance companies yay it's like i i mean that's why like the all of the the fines and the stuff about like deutsche bank and oh what other banks did he have relation it's like i don't fundamentally care because it's kind of <laughs> it's literally like the government is saying like you know we had all this evidence evidence against this guy and we gave him a deal that basically it was a get out of jail free card literally a get out of jail free card <laughs> during the day uh you know, we let this guy go, but because you decided to keep doing a banking relationship with him, and like you're dirty, dirty little bank, you shouldn't be doing that. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, where, where's the punishment for you for letting him go? Where is your punishment for lying to his victims that there was even going to still be federal process? Like the victims involved in it, it when they were trying to prosecute him in Florida, like, they weren't even told that this deal existed. They weren't told that he had been let off the hook. Like, yep. Like, where where is the punishment for the government officials who did this? There isn't going to be. Uh, at best, what's going to happen is that they're going to pay a fine. And the way they pay a fine is that they take taxpayer money and maybe give it as compensation to the victims. But it's like, the government's not going to fine itself, people. <laughs> like, they're not going to punish themselves. Ah, uh, boy. Speaking of financial cartels. Yeah, so this is, uh, I don't know, really, uh, Visa put out a announcement on advancing their approach to digital currency um, earlier in July. And, you know, really on its face, it's pretty much just a blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we're partnering with uh, companies like Coinbase, Fold, Zappo, um, and building bridges between crypto and fiat, like all, all of their uh, crypto cards um, that they do in partnership with these companies. And looking like a, a phrase that they throw out there, and I think this is a pretty accurate assessment of how they run their business, but is Visa is pretty much a network of networks in terms of currencies or payment rails. And they're pretty much just looking at integrating um, crypto um, while, you know, in their words, remaining um, currency and um, payment system agnostic as a company um, through partnerships with companies like that. And, you know, I could really see this because, um, you know, Jack, when he uh, he came on to talk about strike, like he was speaking very highly of the the crypto team over there um that he'd been interacting with personally and pretty much speaking about them as if they get this space to the the same depth that that he does and like i could see a lot of really positive things coming out of this like I don't know, lightning and things like discrete log contracts. Um, I see a door opening to using Visa's network as a payment rail with a proof system that they're not in control of to actually settle real Bitcoin as a result of things on their network. Like I could see a lot of positive synergies like that. But I can also see a lot of negative things. You know, like MasterCard, I think back in like 2018, um, patented a crypto payment system but the core of the design was on being able to run fractional reserve versus crypto deposits um so you know does visa go a direction like that or hooking into things like strike has um like that could go either way and they're they're pretty much um also um you know like i said there's a, a lot here despite it really just being a blah, blah letter on the surface. Um, they've also been collaborating through the World Economic Forum um, on central bank digital currency policies and recommendations. 
um, relating to that. And um, I was completely unaware of this. Um, I, I knew that they built this um, protocol called Zether um, to do private zero knowledge proof based um, smart contracts on, on things like Ethereum. But they also, um, one of their research team members um, was involved in a project called Fly Client. And that's a, a kind of implementation for a proof of proof of work. Um, I think we, we've talked about it a, a few times on the show, uh, maybe a year or two ago. But it's the, the idea of proving um, a certain difficulty weight on a blockchain um, with the headers without having to get all of the headers. Um, and their research team was actually, you know, involved in specking that out. Um, and it's kind of solving a lot of the, the problems of the, the original proof of proof of work proposal. But, um, yeah, uh, really when, when you cut down to it, I mean, this is a massive financial company and their tendrils are already kind of all over this space. You know, and not just in terms of Coinbase's debit card works off Visa. Like they're actually proposing protocol implementations for, you know, very potentially useful stuff. And, you know, they're not just going to go away. They're also proposing killing cash. Mm -hmm. Fun times. I actually can't remember. I think this is something that I said off air in the general mumble chat but like yeah i'm like i'm i'm told every single day i feel like like that there's bitcoin slash crypto friendly people at various large financial institutions and i'm like great for those individual people but the fact is that they're still working they're, they're still working and building an architecture that is the complete opposite of what bitcoin is and what we want bitcoin to be so sure they may be friendly to it but at the end of the day it's like <laughs> it's like you're building the opposite of what i want to see in the world you're building a company that advocates for war on cash you're building a company company that fully 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 embraces financial surveillance you're building a company that engages in censorship extra judicial censorship also like they at the end of the day sure there are individuals in the company who may be friendly but they are part of an organization that i don't want to be a part of and that i hope in the long term goes away um so sure i mean whatever use your resources to give us research that may be helpful but that doesn't make me want to be friends with visa <laughs> at the end of the day i mean i'm not so pessimistic about it as you are but like in, in order to really see a company like this build out the type of infrastructure that i want to see that attitude has to permeate out of the engineering and research departments and into the boardroom where decisions actually get made or it's just gonna get kept bottled up and used uh for purposes that i'm betting most of those people in these kinds of companies wouldn't want to be involved in yeah i mean that that is literally the dynamic at a lot of these companies they have people who want to they have they genuinely have moral character and they want to work on stuff that matters and not surveillance tech uh financial control tech even though that's part of why they have that job in the first place is because they're building towards that and yeah on the side a lot of these companies are willing to put some money into a little altruism fund where they can say oh we're doing this cool stuff too but at the end of the day doesn't usually go into the boardroom it's just uh as uh as someone at a former company that i used to know said uh they're just playing with their toys in the basement uh they're not actually expecting them to do anything uh, they, they obviously wouldn't want to do anything that challenges visa's uh supremacy <laughs> in the uh in the payment processing market mm -hmm. like it's it's one way or the other the the market dynamics 
or people inside the company, like something needs to pressure an attitude change in the board or it, it's just going to stay in the bottle. It's you know, to comment, uh, to uh, respond to a comment in the chat. It's not so much uh, an argument. If you're not with us, you're against us. It's more like, it's more like there are so many aspects of you, of the company that are against us. Like, against our values but then there are some parts of it that are trying to be with us and it's like you know you, you don't necessarily have to be with us but if you are very clearly against us you kind of have to pick <laughs> but yeah so this next thing um is pretty insidious in my opinion Want want to tell us how uh, Chainalysis is going to try to gank a bunch of idiot traders into giving up all kinds of data about themselves? Uh, well, I I didn't even look into that part really, but I I mean I assume given that Chainalysis and its business model is involved, um, they are probably doing analysis on who is using their products. Um, but yeah, Chainalysis has launched a new market analysis website called Market Intel, which, uh, as the block describes it, is aimed at asset managers and financial regulators interested in monitoring the health of crypto markets. Um, imagine that, the the NSA, uh, oh, sorry, I mean, I mean chain analysis. Uh, chain analysis is giving us a slice of their surveillance pie. Um, currently, uh, they are, or at, as of now, with their beta launch of this, they're going to be showing you metrics for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin. Uh, they show these metrics uh, daily as daily highlights, but also as part of the last 30 days, the last 90 days, the last 180 days, etc. Um, and the metric categories include trading, demand, supply, generation, which is like how bitcoins are coming into the market and i guess how miners are selling them and where they're selling them stuff like that and then the last category is risk and that category is probably the most interesting given that their primary business is measuring and representing the risk of coins to their clients and recommending what those clients should do about risky coins and so they have metrics on uh the website for illicit flow or illicit BTC flows as percentage of total flows, um, illicit Bitcoin funds held, and illicit Bitcoin funds placed, which I think is like placed as in they're being moved around to exchanges. They're not just not moving um, or being held in particular addresses. So that's interesting um, because, I mean, that's interesting not so much as I don't know if I trust their definition of illicit, um, because I, as far as I could tell from the website, I don't think they actually explain how they come to that um, determination of how they measure that. But it is still useful to know uh, how much Bitcoin chain analysis views as illicit, um, because obviously they are going to be making recommendations to clients based on those metrics. And so it's nice that maybe we get to have some of that to know about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my first thought when I saw this is traders. Um, traders are who are going to want these kinds of metrics um, to trade off of, look at as, as leading indicators or, or signal. And it is no secret that companies like Chainalysis um, run Electrum servers and other backends like that um, that are openly um, searchable just to dox people um, to get their, their XPUB and dox their entire UTXO site. Um, so yeah, any trader out there um, who unluckily connects to one of those after doxing their IP address, looking at this site, um, that could turn into a very interesting um, data aggregation me or mechanism. And yeah, um, a lot of traders in this, this space are not paying their taxes or, or all of them. 
It's a two-way mirror. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, you know, that, that I think is, is what's probably going to happen with this thing. And I just hope to God that enough people in this space um, call this out as something that you should not use or at least be cautious when using because it, it's, a, it's a fucking chain analytics company. They're going to be scooping up metadata absolutely any way they can. Which is part of the reason that I haven't even visited this site yet. I've actually just grabbed an archive of it instead. Um, I wonder if they'll set up a hidden service will, where they'll, you know, offer this stuff over Tor so that, you know, they can give privacy to their visitors. That's actually, uh, that is a perfect way to troll them. Yeah, it, it, it actually is. More onions, por favor. I will do that after the show. <laughs> Alrighty. So this next one, uh, kind of a mixed bag. Um, I've been following foundation devices um, for a while now, and they've been kind of doing a slow roll um, tease at developing a new hardware wallet in the space. And they've finally uh, gotten to the point of actually showing pictures to the device and um, claiming that they're close to the point of a actual launch and all of the, the specs being released. Now, right now, they're pretty much taking emails, not for pre-order, but for a notification of when they start accepting pre-orders. Now, on face, um, this could wind up being a very solid hardware wallet, um, if all things stand true. Uh, it's pretty much taking the exact same kind of architecture as the cold card, um, the same secure element, um, the same microprocessor, and the same general architecture of how those two interact with each other. Um, and it's just a nice, simple you know, form factor. Like it looks like an old dumb phone, pretty much, um, and has no external communications except a camera and a micro SD slot. Um, and it's uh yeah powered by two AAA batteries so you're not going to need to plug it into anything now yeah at face um if they clone the cold card architecture um they handle the the low level firmware aspects of stuff um without fucking anything up in terms of the different boards and uh components in the device aside from the two core chips um yeah this could be very solid, but there is the potential of kind of screwing things up there. And on top of that, uh, they have kind of ruffled a lot of feathers um, in announcing this. So pretty much um, apparently they have in the entire process of pretty much cloning the cold card um, made absolutely no uh notice to anybody at CoinKite. Um no attempts to, to collaborate as far as maintaining the the firmware code base and such, which they forked off from that. Um and Rodolfo is kind of entertaining the idea now of um a different license besides the the GLP version three. Um kind of under the idea that like, you know, uh, him and Peter at CoinKite <laughs> spent all this time and effort designing the, the new architecture with the cold card, um, you know, programming low level firmware in C and then foundation comes along, copy pasta clones it, and now they're selling it for money. Um, and he's looking at kind of a more restrictive license that would still keep all of the, the hardware and firmware open, still allow private individuals um, to clone things for their own use, but restrict a company from kind of copying the design and selling it as a product. And now 
in Foundation's defense, um, since Rodolfo's made his comments on this, um, they have voiced the intent to merge back any changes or optimizations they've made in the firmware and collaborate going forward in, in the future on those things. But, you know, it's kind of a feathers ruffled. And the potential for security screw ups in porting the firmware to a different board with different components, I mean, it's not negligible. But, you know, I don't know. It's just, it would have been nice if they had kind of reached out and established a line of communication here. But all of that said, um, you know, if they've not made any big fuck ups, then yeah, uh, I think this could be a, a pretty solid secure wallet. Like it's pretty much porting, in my opinion, the most secure hardware architecture in this space right now for managing keys. And if they do that successfully, um, yeah, I mean, that's a solid option. Um, I mean, my only, I haven't looked too much into the announcement, but when I saw the pictures of it, I'm, I would be kind of curious to know how much of the design of the device itself was custom and how much of it was because it very much looks like a phone or something very close to a phone so i'm kind of wondering if they might have repurposed um like shells like heart the hardware parts from some other device i mean it's possible it's not quite like a nokia but uh it's the same general shape like i would not be shocked at all if some dumb phone out there had that exact case but yeah i mean you know hopefully the drama kind of resolves itself and they actually do continue or start to and continue collaborating with cold card for the the firmware maintenance and you know upgrades and stuff that'd be nice but Honestly, um, I can't really blame Rodolfo if things in future get released under a more restrictive license. Like, personally, all I care about is that it's open for security researchers and auditing. Like, I personally don't really care if it's uh, acceptable under the license for another company to clone it as a product. Yeah, I mean, I saw some of that conversation happening um on twitter and i mean i as far as i could tell rodolfo's argument was just that you know the license is not so much the important part the important part about open source at least for him is just that the code is available and it's auditable it's not so much about or he doesn't so much see the value of open source as being the ability of someone else to you know copy the code and use it commercially for their own stuff um and i understand that people disagree with that and that's fine but also it's not it's not fundamentally violating uh you know the important aspects of open source for a person running a business to say sorry i don't want you to use this code and commercial stuff i mean creative commons has versions of their license which say don't use this stuff for commercial purposes without my permission um so it's not it's not i wouldn't say it's like a black violation yeah it's not black and white and it's also i don't i don't see it as a fundamental violation of open source licenses to say don't use this for commercial purposes because creative commons has the same thing they have a bunch of variations of their license that says don't make derivatives uh don't license your derivatives under different license don't use it for commercial purposes they you know they have those variations available and they have a scale of like you know they say i think the most restrictive license is like no derivatives uh non-commercial or something like that um they have they have a sliding scale but they're all still creative commons licenses because the most important aspect of Creative Commons is that you are putting things in the commons so that people can still access it and learn from it and use it privately, um, which is the most important part of how they're trying to combat the extremely restrictive um, copyright scheme 
um, which doesn't really give any freedom to your ability to distribute content or use content. So, mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not really sure like where he got this from but like further down in the thread rodolfo is also kind of implying that they're trying to raise vc money right now and like that i can get like that i because you know CoinKite is an entirely private company and they've funded everything they've developed themselves and so like if foundation devices is looking for investment in bc capital um that i can completely understand why he would be pissed that you know something they have put all the time and work in developing and then another company clones that and starts raising money like i would get incredibly pissed in that situation myself too yeah i think the only the only, I think the real issue in terms of the licensing choice here is that, um, I mean, Cold Card itself um, uses Trezor code or what was originally Trezor code. And the reason that they, the reason Cold Card has the GPL license is because that's what Trezor used for their code. So I'm assuming he's going to have to do some shifting around of like, I, I don't know if you can license, I, I assume you can license well, portions of code in one license and other portions in another, but that's kind of messy. Mm -hmm. I think though, like what they used from Trezor, it wasn't like low level firmware code or anything. It was just the, um, the Python libraries for like playing with Bitcoin data structures. Okay. But yeah. Uh, hopefully I, I, I would like to see hopefully like foundation, first of all, not fuck up, um, porting anything and creating security holes and then actually collaborate back with CoinKite. But, you know, hopefully, um, this plays out well and, you know, something can come of this because honestly, uh, we need more um new hardware companies that are actually building things securely and not being shade balls because like the that entire space is just every couple months i look into it and there's just more and more shady weird ass companies making all kinds of absurd claims about security and i really don't want to see this next bull run coincide with that market being flooded with scams and insecure garbage because that will fuck a decent amount of people. All right, you though. Next up, C Lightning 0.9.0 Rat Poison Squared on Steroids has been released. Um, so this is going to have both uh, key send and multi-path payments, uh, which we mentioned a couple weeks ago, I think, uh, got merged. And there is also um, support for Watchtower plugins now um, so that that side of things can actually start getting built out. But under the hood, <clears throat> um, some really awesome changes. Um, they have added some new RPC methods to sign and send PSBT transactions um, to make wallet interoperability um, a lot easier and support you know, building other types of protocols and things on top of C Lightning. And as well to kind of go along with that, added an RPC method to kind of reserve or unreserve an output for exclusive use um, in PSBT operations so that anything involving kind of multiple steps in a protocol um, is easily supported now as well as a new hook um, for plugins to grab that just reports pretty much any change in uh, UTXO um, status with anything. And this has all been made possible by Libwally, uh, the library that Fully Noted's been using to go ham with all kinds of PSBT functionality. So uh, yeah, this is very nice. I really think, you know, over the next year, uh, we're going to see the architecture here start paying off in 
dividends in terms of making it easier to build, you know, things on top of lightning or new um, protocols based on pre-signed transactions. Because, you know, come on, come on, think about it, Janine. You just ar arbitrary PSBT support plugins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could make C Lightning make state chains. Stake chains? State chains. Uh, Ruben Steak. Thompson's. Pro no. Steak. State. Steak. Steak. I'm sorry. Um, I only eat carrots. I want steak. Eat your vegetables, Saifedean. Boo. But yeah, this is, uh, I think, a pretty awesome uh, release. I should not have just imbibed a random thing in the middle of the episode. Okay, so let's move along. Um, Nadav Ivgi, uh, the developer behind the Bitcoin wallet tracker, um, just dropped, I I don't know, Minsk, am I? It's, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a... A uh, new top level language on top of a uh, mini script. Uh, Peter Woolley's language for um, s like programmatic analysis of Bitcoin scripts for optimizations. And, you know, I think this is a very nice, um, simple language for this. <clears throat> it's got a very clear um, operator semantics, like two, it's just real simple shit, double and symbol. Um, it's a combination of conditions to um, completely vertical lines is either or condition. So semantics, easy to pick up. Um, pretty much just brackets and um, as simple as just number of um, to create different threshold constructs like a two of three or three of five. And you can even take advantage of the um, probability functions in Miniscript where you can assign, um, you know, either numerical or just kind of pre-tag uh, pre the most likely branch to be spent. Um, you know, take advantage of that so that Miniscript will look for the most efficient way to actually make a raw script in that form. Um, and you can even go so far as to define whole variables, such as, you know, just create a variable redeem and then define that as a public key and a signature from that and a hash preimage um, so that you can actually build out whole functions um, for larger contracts in just a very easy, like high level script language. Um, that allows you to really kind of condense it as much as you want or not want to. Um, so it's like the, the language I think is, is real simple. Like you just spend five minutes um, on, on a site and you will grok how the language works if you have any familiarity with programming languages. But, <clears throat> you know, kind of a point uh, Peter Woola spelled out in, in response to Nadab's uh, announcement of this is this is this is all fun and cool but in order to really gain any kind of utility from this um you need wallets to support this you know you need libraries you know i think like magical bitcoin wallet is a a perfect example here you know this is the kind of stuff alikos is trying to do is a wallet um, library that supports everything you can do to to build different projects out of and until you really get, you know, a wallet library or wallet architecture that supports working with Miniscript or languages built on top of Miniscript, there's not really a, an easy way to go, oh, I made this script and throw it at a wallet and actually do something with it. So, you know, this is a pretty awesome um, starting point from one end. But eventually, um, wallets need to start filling in the other end, or you're not going to get anywhere near the utility out of a language like this that you could. Beep, beep. Boop, boop. <laughs> Alrighty. So I'm sorry, I was distracted by the conversation about meeting people in VR, which sounds so futuristic. <laughs> Well, uh, 
want to run down why a big company uh, or no wait my brain okay um foundation yeah all right you just take over here while my brain takes a second to get itself back to a semblance of normality well so it's actually both so you weren't wrong um but yeah this is a zcash uh double story whammy uh today because on july 16th the zcash blockchain completed their fourth hard fork called heartwood which includes a consensus change or included a consensus change to coinbase payouts as part of zip 213 which is if people are familiar with bips in bitcoin it's the zcash equivalent of that um fewer uh people to review it though uh, but basically, uh, what zip 213 was, is that, uh, as it says in the zip Zcash inherited the concept of Coinbase transactions from Bitcoin because it literally is a fork of Bitcoin. And I think still to this day, the, the biggest contributor to Zcash code is Vladimir <laughs> Vangelon. So yeah, uh, special transactions, uh, inside each block that are allowed to have no inputs. That's what the Coinbase is. And these transactions are created by miners during block creation and collect the block reward and transaction fees into new transparent outputs then, that can then be spent. Um, on the path to deprecating and removing Bitcoin inherited transparent addresses within the Zcash network, a required step is to be able to create Coinbase transactions that have no transparent outputs. However, Zcash was launched with a consensus rule preventing Coinbase transactions from containing shielded outputs, instead enforcing that Coinbase funds could not be spent in transactions with transparent outputs. Therefore, the, therefore it is now necessary to modify the consensus rules in order to enable miners to start using sapling addresses, which is their uh, one of their recent hard forks um that improved um shielded address usage and well somewhat <laughs> in short uh basically um it allows miners to receive the block award to a shielded address which is the address format that actually gives you privacy in zcash um which is very underutilized shall we say and so now um the reason that this came to my attention now and as a story is because there is a newsletter called attacking zcash run by hush developers and i think hush is um an alternative implementation of zcash and the newsletter is dedicated to documenting attacks and defenses in Z in the zcash protocol and they i think they is um specifically Duke Leto on Twitter. Um, uh, basically, they published a blog that says because of how the Zcash company chose to implement this feature and because of some previous technical limitations, this feature will actually reduce privacy of the individual miner in the shielded pool. And the reason um, is uh, because Duke Leto had pointed out back in May of this year that their implementation of this consensus change currently requires that Zcash miners actually hard code their shielded address into the client. So the address that they're going to receive the Bitcoin to has to be hard coded into the client. And as he explains, because miners must set their shielded address when starting their node, it will be fixed until the next time that they stop and restart. This encourages miners to set one shield address, shielded address and mine to it for long periods of time, since changing it would require stopping and starting, uh, restarting a node. Not only is that extra work, but you cannot mine while your node is restarting, so it has a definite cost that can be calculated per minute of downtime. Miners do not want downtime, and hence they will not use the feature correctly. Can I say... Danger! This client engages in address reuse by default. Error, error. Abort, abort. Um, furthermore, he said that that was my own thing that was not in the post. <laughs> but furthermore, um, he says, shielded Coinbase uh, forces a miner to publicize their address and hence, is, and hence opens them up to various denial of service attacks and de-anonymization attacks, which were only possible um, if the attacker actually knows the address. One minute while I scroll. If you want to comment, go ahead. I'm just trying to digest the technicals of this, and I feel like slapping my forehead. So the author of the... Um, I think this is still quoting from the blog post. The author of Zcash Protocol offers the advice to only use one shielded address for mining and then use private... Uh, 
addresses, private shielded addresses for other uses. So basically accept it and reuse a shielded address and then move those funds into other shielded addresses. And I believe the author of this zip was Daria. I can't remember exactly. That was the person it's in the blog post. There was a specific person that he responded to and brought this issue up to in May um, and why it was bad. And yeah, so um as he says, this is not as private as you could be since in the past there was a, a CVE which could identify the IP address of a shielded address. If another similar bug happens, which is very possible, IP addresses of minor shielded addresses could be correlated to IP addresses of other shielded addresses, proving that they are owned by the same person who is running a node at that IP address. Um, and that previous bug that he mentions there specifically as being a potential problem still is something that we discussed in episode 193, um, which basically was discovered that nodes that were using shielded addresses um, could be de-anonymized through linkage to the IP address of the node, which is really terrible, and we don't know if it was exploited. Um, so Leto alleges that basically this zip was mainly implemented for marketing purposes, because if you may remember... Um, in the last, you know, on and off in the last 15 episodes or so, I have occasionally brought up Zcash uh, basically trying to measure and increase the usage of shielded addresses because it's extremely, extremely low. It's like less, it is or was less than 5%, and I think they've only managed to get to that recently. It was actually a lot lower than that, less than a percent um, for most of Zcash's history. And... Um, so basically, he thinks that the reason this was implemented uh, terribly is because, sure, um, it doesn't actually give the miners privacy by using the shielded addresses. It doesn't actually take advantage of the privacy that is offered by it. But when it comes to the metrics of the adoption of shielded addresses, this is going to show up in their graphs and it's going to make them look good. So he basically says that this is being used to improve their metrics for the usage of shielded addresses and transactions, despite having some significant privacy pitfalls. How embarrassed do you think they are that they've spent so much time trying to create a honeypot for illegal activity and nobody uses it for that? Well, I I can't... Uh... I can't, we, we don't know the answer to that for most people, but as I said, this is a double whammy and maybe the reason that a certain person left is because of such incompetence. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good segue if you want to slide along. So the, uh, if you may, may remember back in episode 189, I talked about the trademark battle between the Zcash company, now known as the Electric Coin Company, and the Zcash nonprofit foundation. Uh, and it appears that that trademark battle has had some long-lasting consequences on the space as a whole, the Zcash space. Um, because yesterday, the executive director of the Zcash foundation uh, Josh Cincinnati announced that he would be leaving the foundation and they don't have a replacement at the moment. Um, the official announcement from the Zcash Foundation states, after an incredible three-year tenure at Zcash Foundation's inaugural, as, an, as the Zcash Foundation's inaugural executive director, Josh Cincinnati is resigning from his position effective today. The board is sorry to see that our excellent first commander, truly worthy of his name, despite uh, our ranks, um, Depart, depart our despite our ranks depart our ranks he is departing our ranks uh but we're excited for his future endeavors both inside and outside of the zcash community and we're also excited to start a new chapter at the foundation the process to carefully select someone to fill josh's very large shoes is ongoing we've planned on this transition for some time until we're certain we found the right executive director uh, the Zcash Foundation board will collectively guide the organization, and you can expect uh, foundation activities to proceed uninterrupted. The foundation's eminently versatile director, Anthony Hodge, will lead an, on execution of our current roadmap alongside our diligent and entrepreneurial engineering team, and Josh will consult on finding his replacement. 
And so that was what was published by the Zcash Foundation on their blog. But Josh published his own farewell thoughts on Twitter as a gist. And there are a couple of passages. It's quite, it's like, uh, it made up two pages of screenshots. Um, so it's quite long. But there are a couple of passages in it that I think are worth highlighting because they kind of show that there's been an ongoing strain with the so-called uh, two of two multi-sig governance model that the foundation and the electric coin company have been trying to meme their way into, but not necessarily actually executing. So one minute while I scroll. So uh, uh, again, this is just excerpts from his statement, but I think they're interesting. Um, he says the foundation's efforts to distribute power in the ecosystem while successful have taken a personal toll our landmark tr uh, trademark negotiation and the, ex and the successful conclusion of the dev fund debate were huge wins for the privacy or for the Zcash ecosystem, but they were gained at the cost of my relationship with the ECC, as in the electric coin company, leadership and damaged my ability to collaborate with them effectively. Simply put, mutual trust was irreparably lost. Since I view it as unlikely that the ECC's top leadership, I am assuming that most likely includes Zuko Wilcox, um, would ever change, or that the structure of power would meaningfully change at any successor organization, I instead choose to leave. New leadership within the foundation offers the opportunity to reset that relationship. And then a little past that, he writes, uh, beware relentless, unexamined positivism and near-religious zealotry. Such behavior encouraged and stoked by those who wish to believe such things because they're easier or more cynically because it might entrench their own power can overwhel overwhelm pragmatism and self-examination and drown out valid feedback. The Zcash community is fortunate to have impressive critics, folks like James Prestwich, Justin Ehrenhofer, and I think it's supposed to be, is it Ser Sering, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to pronounce his name, Sering Nuther? I don't know. Uh, anyway, list of critics, and the more, the more the project welcomes Sears' critique, the stronger it will become. Ignoring, misinterpreting, manipulating, or dismissing valid criticism to maintain an aura of dogmatic idealism does a disservice to critics and the project ex itself. Do not fall into this trap and call out those that do. Remember that Zcash and other efforts um, at private digital money are open to protocols, not startups. Do not cargo cult startupism into the core of your protocol and resist attempts for, or by others to do so. A protocol for private digital money should serve the public good, not the needs of a select few business interests. Hashtag grocery money. Um, <laughs> again, I, <laughs> I am just inserting that. That is not in the post, but I could not resist. Um, uh, uh, another passage question where influence truly lies and who wields it if checks and balances exist. Are they meaningfully or purely theoretical? Or are they meaningful or purely th theoretical? Consider what is and isn't being said publicly, the relationships that may exist without public knowledge. Mm -mm -mm. Blockchain alliance. Uh, again, my insertion, ignore. Uh, and never be afraid to question the power brokers of the Zcash ecosystem and hold them to task. One can simply claim, we're transparent, or I respect your privacy. They have to earn both through habitual action. I believe that by relinquishing my station of power, I'm sending a signal that these things matter to the foundation, but they should matter throughout the ecosystem. End quote. <laughs> so, thoughts on what he may be talking about? I don't know, the memeing, the never mandating, you know, shielded addresses, the nonsense about not private enough for criminals. Like, uh, it could be any of it. What what I do find, I mean, I understand he's probably in a position where he does he he feels like it's not right to talk about what he's talking about. But it is kind of funny because he starts off the post by saying that like transparency is very important to him, and that's why he's writing this post. And then he kind of just fills the rest of the post with these little these little hints of like something went wrong, but he's not going to tell you exactly what or who's responsible or what 
what exactly he's alluding to. I just find that a bit funny because it's like, let's be transparent, but also I'm going to just hint at things without telling you, like, straight what happened. So that's, I find that a bit funny about the post in general. Yeah, I'm betting that's just not wanting to fling shit. Yeah. But this, I mean, despite the fact that he's not naming names and things, I feel like this is a, and again, I only read parts of his post. If you read his post from beginning to end, especially the beginning of his post, you get the impression that, like, in general, you if you only read the first couple of paragraphs, you get the sense that it's going to be a very positive post, but I felt like these were pretty hard-hitting parts. Like, he is clearly dissatisfied with something, and he thinks that something is wrong, specifically with the Zcash company. So, yeah, I... I would like to know more, and I hope people listen, and I'm wondering if the things that I think he's referencing are the things that he is actually referencing. Well, I mean, it could be, and like, would he, as a foundation member, potentially have an NDA with ECC? Um, I mean, eh, it's possible. I don't know in terms of like how foundations are structured. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, because he would have been like at the top, basically at the top. So I'm. You know, I, I don't know whether it's typical for the executive director to have NDAs with the foundation. So that's not a question that I know the answer to, but it's possible. It's also possible that he just wants to be nice and not fling shit, but he also just wants to warn people in general, which is still good. Mm hmm I mean, it seems <laughs> like you don't put sentences like beware relentless unexamined positivism and near religious zealotry uh, and that, you know, don't ignore criticism and beware of people who are trying to gain power and all this and, you know, relationships behind the scenes. You don't include that in a post about why you're leaving unless it's important and based on something that happened. Mm -hmm. and that, I, I agree. It's also important to note that, as far as I could tell, the public response to him leaving was all positive. Like, it was people saying, you know, good luck wherever you go, and sad to see you leave. Um, I didn't check whether that was specific. I don't think most of that was actually from Zcash people. It was just people in the space in general were saying you know, sorry to see you leave. So it doesn't, I don't, I haven't seen any evidence of like him specifically being involved in anything suspicious. Mm -hmm. But yeah, fun time in the sea cash world. Zuku's grocery budget continues. Mm -hmm. So this next one's just kind of a, a quick update uh let me find it real quick yeah so um i i know i noticed this last week and i just i don't know why i forgot to uh put it on the news desk but uh jeremy rubin um has a fifty thousand dollar one year grant uh for bitcoin core contribution thanks to did somebody say volatility Bitmax, and uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty good. To, or glad to see this. Like Jeremy can come on kind of strong when he's talking about his proposals and shit, but his uh, op check template verify um, BIP is something that I would absolutely love to see. Uh, you know, actually make it into Bitcoin after Taproot and SigHash no input and all that. Uh, and him actually having some predictable income now to keep working on that is pretty awesome. And as well, like he's uh, also developing um, the Sapio high level um, language to build out stuff with that. So, yeah. I think uh, just give a slow golf clap to um, 
funding slowly taking care of itself without a big centralized uh, Bitcoin developer foundation. Meanwhile, uh, Brian Armstrong is still having a very hard think about whether he should ever pay a Bitcoin core developer or not. A hard think that has been ongoing for many years and has no uh, no end in sight. Well, I think he's waiting for the, the work on Ethereum too. Remember that when Luke was trying to get funded? And they told him uh, no, unless he's willing to work on Ethereum too. Yeah, or um, what's the newest shit coin that they've listed? Dad. Got to work on Dad. <laughs> I don't even know how to react to that. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so disappointed that you missed that joke. They no, I got it. But a coin it's just Dad. my my brain just immediately shut down, and rather than laughing, it went just deep depression pay me daddy <laughs> i'll be your daddy oh my god can i pay you and dad <laughs> daddy warbucks oh my god this is so dirty the uh jokes are endless. youtube is is gonna gonna cancel us now I've already got the bald head. He would make a great daddy warbucks, wouldn't he? <laughs> All he has to do now is adopt a red orphan. Who's a red-haired orphan? Okay, okay. I need to dig us out of this. Um, <laughs> so, you should find the, the link to this in the, the show notes. But um, a committee... Or, in Wyoming, I'm um, dealing with all of the, the blockchain slash Bitcoin legislation uh, they're pushing out there. Uh, did a stream um, kind of talking about digital identity. And, uh, you know, they touched on things like uh, DAOs. And one of the questions there was specifically um, should a specific um, form of LLC be established to recognize, um, you know, a DAO is a legal entity, or is that something that could actually be facilitated um, workably with just the current framework of LLC registrations? Um, but you know, the first hour is mostly on um, digital identity, and it's kind of some things in here. I think are going in a very good direction in terms of thinking through the problem and the way that things can wind up going wrong. Um, like, you know, for instance, one of the explicit um, design goals um, Christopher Allen is shooting for, um, you know, he was on the, the committee, um, is to not create uh, another social security number. Like for those who don't know, um, that was created specifically for social security payments um that was not supposed to be anything else and it somehow just became the magic identifier um that everybody uses for everything to verify your identity and so specifically in that sense um shape the legislation in a way that facilitates recognizes and encourages compartmentalization of ids like you should have a different identifier for you know your employer versus driving versus buying age restricted things and not roll all of those into a single thing that leaves metadata leaking all over the place and you know a big kind of point of contention here or not, not, not so much contention, um, just a concern, is looking for any kind of real application of this um, or ones that might, uh, you know, get built out to look at to inform um, the legislation in terms of like the definition of an ID. Like what does that constitute? What does that apply to? What kind of legal weight, um, importantly? Um, is behind that, given that a cryptographic key, once stolen, um, if that's tied to the ID, like, well, how do you resolve that? Like, how, how do you account for that? 
And on the other side, though, um, there is a company, M-Shift, that's a, a really old um, you know, online banking company um, or payment services. And one of their representatives goes through an entire um, presentation um, during the committee hearing um, on attaching uh, identity to payments, like digital payments. And this is kind of where I started getting a little, a little skeptical in terms of just baking that in in a new way with a new technology rather than extracting that and removing it because fundamentally like there is no fucking reason that in any way personally identifiable information needs to get baked into and and tagged along with a payment itself and now in the presentation they're still talking about separated um you know identities like the a proposal um where was it yeah like a different uh key identity to log into a surface a, a different key identity to attach to a payment a different identity um you know for attesting to or, or signaturing things um in the notary sense and you know, th this is this is a really sticky issue in terms of digital IDs. Um, you know, how far do you go in terms of removing metadata, and is it far enough? Because, in, in my opinion, if you're just going to silo different types of interactions, um, but still create massive metadata trails that could still be reconstructed um, ties across things be proven in different ways i mean like ultimately um if you get arrested and your keys are not secured properly um wow they can take your master key and now try to tie everything together and so i i don't like the direction that some of the applications they're talking about are really uh going in that sense but you know ultimately i, I feel like i have been saying this a lot this year um this is just gonna happen and there's nothing really anybody can do to stop it so it's a matter of how does it play out mm -hmm. so i was like you know that this is one of those uh videos it's like four hours long um I would absolutely recommend everybody go actually watch that themselves because I, there is just no way I can meaningfully condense a four hour video in a couple minutes here. But yeah. When politicking, to. you need to keep nudging in a direction or they tend to wander off in a, another one. I have to insert another daddy joke here. <laughs> Sugar daddy honey pot. <laughs> oh boy. Alright, but I guess uh we're down to the last two and uh wanna move along. Yep. So uh as you may have seen last month in June. I, well, actually you didn't see it until July 1st, but I launched a newsletter called This Month in Bitcoin Privacy, and yesterday I published the second issue for the month of July, and many of the stories have already been ones that I discussed on Block Digest anyway, but if you missed them, it includes uh, IRS seeking to trace privacy coins in Lightning, Class action lawsuits against Plaid Inc., the end of surveillance capitalism, chain analysis and the boiling frog, which is Epstein related, as I've already mentioned, um, hyper onionization, which is about uh, a feature, new feature in the Tor browser, which marks whether a given website has an onion service available that you can go to instead, um, Coinbase contracting with the Secret Service and IRS, the 
uh, origin of cypherpunk because this month was the 17th anniversary of the death of Jude Millen and I wanted to bring that in because she is the person who coined cypherpunk. Um, also Junk in the Trunk, which is uh, related to the episode of a lightning podcast that Shinobi was a co-host on, guest co-host, and also the Samurai Wallet Address Reuse Report, um, a Fourth Amendment lawsuit against the IRS, How I Knew Your Customer, which is about the travel rule compliance that a bunch of U.S. exchanges are creating some kind of customer data sharing bulletin board for that they're supposedly going to release a white paper about this month, and also Schnorr signature and taproot activation that's coming up, and the ledger, ledger data breach of their marketing database. So, yep, that's what I've been up to. Woo! I actually forgot about that ledger incident. Yep. Uh, I mean, it made me, when I was adding it, it made me think about uh, the fact that we've now had three, this is now the third, at least the known one, the third cryptocurrency company in the last month that has disclosed a... A data breach of their marketing database. It seems to be a trend of them not storing customer information securely. Yeah, and you know, I gotta do it. Um, I I found it really kind of greasy and grimy how Trezor immediately um jumped to uh, meme themselves as responsible because we delete your email and all your data for the order after so long. Um. But they they try to shove as many users into a flow as possible to click their newsletter, which then persists your email. And you know, as we we were shown with um, the entire Twitter hack, um, you know, all it takes is an email and a database dump somewhere out there to get a lot more information from that. So I just found that um, kind of greasy. Like if you're going to collect emails or do a newsletter or whatever, but then don't turn around and virtue signal about how you don't store user information. Yeah, you do. All right. And I guess for this last one, just really quick. Um, Blockstream has dumped out uh, the Blockstream scam database. Um, and it's pretty much um, an indexed uh, database with a search function for all of the different ways and types of scams people try running um, in Blockstream's name on different platforms uh, to con money out of people. And uh, yeah, this is pretty awesome. And um, I know it pretty it'd probably be a pretty big um, resource undertaking, so it's not really a reasonable thing to just go all the companies in this space should do this but um it would be really nice if the ones that actually have the resources to throw around and have their name used in scams like that to do just as yeah like that would just be a good thing and even if every company out there is not doing it if these types of things were to proliferate and get a lot of attention you know maybe that would help wise somebody up before they get scammed just seeing that even if somebody approaches them you know with a a company name that doesn't do this but yeah don't fall for the scam guys they're just trying to get your bitcoin don't let them sugar daddy honey pot <laughs> all righty though uh pretty much wraps us up for the day so uh Final thoughts time. Oh, that so that reminds me. I I just want to say this because I really hope that people notice a joke I made. But um, I quoted what Brian Armstrong said in the interview that he did for what Bitcoin did, and um, obviously he didn't mention any people by name during the interview in terms of people that made them aware of the fact that they had hired hacking team people that was probably a bad decision um he just referred to us as angry people on twitter and so when i quoted that part um 
I uh, there's a there's a super script that I inserted into the quote where I said it's a me Mario and I linked to my own tweet where I was one of those people and I felt like that was a good place to put an Italian joke. <laughs> you know what that I, that is like the most dismissive like arrogant fucking thing ever and you know what i i i am i wasn't pissed when i first heard that i'm pissed now because you know what i am one of those angry people on twitter and you know what i was also when i was being angry on twitter i was a fucking customer so brian armstrong can go fuck himself i'm not just gonna go fire people because someone is angry on twitter I'm not going to fire the black hats who have gotten people killed and imprisoned because someone is angry on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, because of that, I got to insert my little Mario joke. Well, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take, uh, take us out with a very pessimistic final thought. Um, wait, 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 wait. Are, so you're, you're going to do the last one? Well, I don't know. Well, then it won't be the last one, but it's going to be pessimistic. But um, yeah, so the uh, House committee hearing with uh, Silicon Valley, uh, very interesting. Um, lots of opening statements tying themselves to, uh, you know, American exceptionalism and success stories and, and doing right by the consumer. Um to then get eviscerated in all the ways that they take advantage of, monetize, spy on, um, and in some cases experiment on their fucking users. Um, but ultimately, um, the the Republican head of the committee circulated a memo to the Republicans on the committee, um, which they quickly claimed was just a, a bullet point um, to you know help form your questions, not advice on how to engage in the hearing. Um, that specifically. Um, advise steering away from antitrust accusations or, or painting anything negative um, that they're doing um, as being enabled by being a monopoly. Um, just just deal with uh, you know infractions in, in other ways. And um, you know, last thing really that stuck out to me was when asked bluntly if they. Um, if the heads of these companies thought that China was stealing American intellectual property, um, Google, um, huh? Apple, I've never heard. Um, Facebook, everybody knows they're doing it. <laughs> and then Amazon and more, um, you know, well, we haven't had that happen to us, but I've seen reports. So I just thought that was a very interesting, um, you know, yeah, that everybody knows that happens. Out of, out of Mark Zuckerberg, like, uh, uh, yep, yep, that happens. I'm on your side, America. Remember, not China. I just, th I thought that was a very interesting jump. Um, and ultimately, I think um, probably nothing's gonna happen out of this, and we're probably um, gonna see these companies explode as the US government turns to them to repatriate uh, manufacturing infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we're watching the birth of the corporate states of America in, in a much more visceral way than has ever existed in this country. I did not pay too much close attention to the hearing, but it was playing with an earshot of me. And I... I mean, the two things that stuck out to me was one, um, as, as related to what you quoted, I find it extremely fascinating how, you know, you had some of the most powerful people in the, in Silicon Valley, in the technology space, and they are surprisingly, uh, they have surprisingly little insight into what goes on in their company. Um, it's like amazing that they just don't seem to know what goes on. Kind of weird. Um, and I also found it funny. <laughs> I found it funny that like, what was it? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it was related, but I remember one, at least one instance, I think it was done multiple times though, where a congressperson asked 
um like zuckerberg or something like she literally quoted from an email uh that he had sent or someone had sent to him and he just had no idea that it happened and it's like this kept repeating where it's like hey we're literally quoting something that you actually said and you seem to not remember it like do you all suffer from dementia like what is going on here like these hearings at the end of the day are just a waste of time because um it's like you're not gonna get answers from these people these people and one of the things they keep repeating is like oh I don't have that with me right now, but I'll I'll look into it and I'll have my people send it to your office. And it's like, they never actually end up doing that. And even if they do do that, that's not a good response because there's no guarantee that the congressperson that that information gets sent to is going to publish it. It's basically a way of saying, I don't want to say this publicly, but I'll send it to you privately to look at. And it's like, it's like this, these hearings are not for us. But I also find it funny that they had a... Uh, technical difficulties <laughs> during <laughs> during the proceeding it's like um we still have not been able to figure out how to do uh you know video meetings even when it's for congressional hearings mm -hmm. got anything else though before i take us out yes um well i feel like making a bill clinton reference here i do not recall Sending that email. Where's my tickle me Monica? <laughs> uh, oh. I... And um, I haven't done an Assange update in a while, so I have one now. And that has to do with an investigation that was published by Declassified UK. Um, they basically tried to do some freedom, freedom of information requests about the now head judge of the case of Vanessa, Vanessa Baritzer, Baritzer, um, because there is very little that's known about her, um, outside of some public information about cases that she's been involved with, um, and an Instagram photo of her, um, but basically they did, they tried to do a FOIA basically and it wasn't very extensive it was just like what what cases has she presided over what were the nature of those cases and what, how how did it conclude and you'd think that that i mean it's bad enough that that information isn't just publicly available to begin with but apparently the um in the UK, the agency that was handling it, um, they basically said, sorry, we can't give that to you. Some of that is, like, private or something. And it's like, what? You can't even give us... Because usually they would at least respond with, well, you can give you the names of the cases and the conclusion, but we can't give you, like, if, if, if the defendant's name is, like, a child or something, sometimes they don't want to release that. But they basically blocked their FOIA request about which cases a particular judge was involved in, which sounds very strange. And the reason it's also strange is because they did a FOIA request for a different judge and they got a response back. Um, they said it was, I mean, they gave a different response. It was like, this the, this request is, uh, or the, the resources that we would have to commit to fulfilling this request is very voluminous. Could you like scale back your request a bit? Which is... Also not ideal, but it's clearly different. It's a different type of response. And so it's interesting that a judge involved in a political case is having some uh, stoppers put on people trying to figure out just who she is. Um, but what they were able to find based on some uh, archive databases is that for, I think it was 20 something cases um, that they were able to find where she was a judge and what the ruling was. 96% of extradition cases that she presided on uh, ended up um, with a positive extradition ruling, as in the defendant was supposed to be extradited to the country. And I think one of those cases was for the United States. Another one was also for Turkey. Um, and 26% of those cases were successfully overturned. So almost a third. But still, 96% of cases she ruled to extradite the individual, which is important information to consider since she is the judge in Assange's case. Joy. Well, you did it. You took us out on a pessimistic tone. 
Well, I guess we'll uh, catch you later, punks. Toodles. Sugar Daddy Honey Pot. Yeah, you can have a voice yet. Yeah, you can have a voice yet. Yeah, you can have a voice yet. Yeah, you can have a voice yet.